So who would like to ask the first question? So I'll address my first question to you. Um, uh, so looking at those graphs where you added phosphorus to the soils, mm -hmm. and there were two data points for each graph. So one, if I understood correctly, represents the unavailable phosphorus, and one is the, uh, no. The, the, the green one was if we're just adding orthophosphate, so potassium hypophosphate. Um, so just chemically, what happens to the same concentration of phosphorus when we add it to the soil versus when we add that phosphorus in the form of your ball. Yeah. Okay. That, that, the other point was the your ball. Okay, now it makes more sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, we're over, over here. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Ray, start the experiment, we got the plants all to the same level, but on the zoom, and then we start measuring whether it comes all the on the zoom. Okay. So it's been advised that we start measuring from that point. The reason why we have more in the commercial fertilizer is because commercial fertilizers are complete. They have all the nutrients that probably the mint needs. We all know that herbal is not a complete fertilizer. You have some micronutrients that exist or you can find them in herbal but they are not at the level that the plants need. Yeah. On the other hand, the calcium magnesium grower is one of the best commercial fertilizer to grow plant stock in nurseries. It provides complete nutrition plus calcium and magnesium. In Australia it's very important because we have soft food. So also herbal doesn't have calcium and enough calcium and magnesium. So we haven't yet done the beef tissue analysis. So once we get to that, yeah. I can answer all these questions about what happened during those stages of growth. Because it could be one of the micronutrients or the micronutrients that inhibited or restricted the growth of the herbal treatment. Okay. Thanks. Um, Sean, you had your hand up. Yeah, based on the uh, characteristics of uh, your fertilizer, so you mentioned about 875. Yeah, that can be right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's what uh, we got. In fact, uh, that's uh, maybe we need to cross check. Yeah. Looks like uh, it's impossible to get the I level of. I'll, I'll send you the yeah. Almost like there's I'll no water. The yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> that's why if we use uh, this one, in your maybe your say pH is 3.3, then you give to the your plant, then you have uh, osmotic, you know, release. Uh, so I'm not yeah. sure whether. When you apply your fertilizer, you dilute with tap water or just use it as it is because it's too high concentration and osmotic pressure will I suck your own water in I your don't plant. know if it was tap water or if it was RO water. That we, because that if we you mix with tap water, water, it will be pH will be neutralized because relatively your concentration yeah, no, will be very it's, low. It didn't neutralize it. Um, yeah, no, the, we spent a lot of time looking at that and we were very surprised yeah it didn't neutralize it at all okay we need to yeah. cross check later yeah. on and i'll yeah. I'll, I'll, send you the report. I'll send you we we had it tested outside yeah. it wasn't just us doing the test because we were surprised by it so i'll but i'll share that with you yeah, yeah. yeah. um you had a question yeah. uh yeah question for dana um i'm just wondering in your um in your plan are you going to be searching for promising niches market niches for this material. I'm just thinking about the fact that multiple people have commented on issues of scale. So are there places that would be the targets for uptake of this, given that we can't address all of Broadacre? So who might be the right target? Um, at this point, our project is slightly different to that. So we would be working, so with, with Gary, to identify 
who would be um, our target um, market, our niche, and, and that could be, um, you know, home home gardeners. It could be, you know, tomato high end horticulturists, whatever. Um, and then start to ask the questions of what they currently use. So we're, we're not starting with the Euro and New Gold products and looking for markets. We're actually sort of flipping that and starting, you know, at that end. So it's a little bit different, I think, our project to then see what, what it would take to design something for those specific markets. Yeah. Although there might be, who knows, it might be emergent and there might be ways to see how we can weave New Gold and Euro into that um, discussion. And it's yeah, certainly something we'll be discussing. So this probably is my ignorance, but any of the experimental is put uh, put hands up this question. Okay. So what is your expectation? Do we expect that Urval and Ugo will perform better or as far as the commercial fertilizer or slightly less that we are happy with? Like do we have any prior expectations? Oh, well I think that a conventional fertilizer is um, meeting all the plant um, <coughs> needs. So anything that we start off with isn't going to. So that's why when I was looking at um, explaining my methodology, part of it is looking at formulation. One of the things that we've done previously in biosolicide was actually having a mix of white organo mineral fertilizers, which has complete um, uh, has has all the requirements. So certainly you wouldn't think that that's going to be the, the case. So part of the characterization, and I think that's where it it's quite powerful to actually even, you know, compare you gold with herbal to different processes to see how they, they match and, and determine then well, what is it, how do we make those various formulations. So yeah, definitely you, you wouldn't, just, the expectation is that it's going to be as good, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the best combination in the future is to include herbal or any other urine based fertilizer in a Fertilizer program and a, and a site or an agriculture land, and then see how it performs in a, in a program, in a complete program. Because if you apply it solely, it's not going to give you the best results compared to the commercial one because of you know the analysis that we know of. It's just the, the point of having that resource recovered and then reused inland and then. Closing that cycle, that's the most important part. It's like, how can we reuse those nutrients without losing them into the ocean? So, one of the challenges with organic fertilizers or conventional ones like compost or, or biosols is they've got a slow release. And the ability to add a um, synthetic is that you've got a quick, quick release to the um, plant as quickly when needed. And then you've got that benefit. So, it's just understanding you know, when it becomes available and if it is available. So for instance, the biosolids like biochar, a lot of the peas locked up, that's not available. When you look at other ways that, okay, can you mine the pea for something better than to use on agriculture? Um, so there's a lot of factors. And, uh, yeah. This is to all the experimental people. You've got your own research design, great randomized designs. I'm just thinking of, are there any auxiliary parameters that we could collect that could answer future questions like I'm interested in when the medium to long term use of those fertilizers on the microbiome and the, so if we collect samples as we go and even if we store them just extract the DNA store it it'll facilitate those further questions we explored that I can then model but you know the chance to get this empirical data is so rare it would be just great to collect auxiliary parameters if it's not too expensive. But we sort of need to know what parameters you're collecting so we can say, could you add in X, Y, and Z? Um, and I don't know how we can, what platform we can have to sort of say, and what, any metadata that we could share. And, and it's, it's a two-way street, yeah. right? We need, we need to know what types of samples, exactly. uh, yeah. or what types of things that you've <coughs> learned and what samples we should collect and how should we archive them. Yes. Well, same question. That you're asking about the heavy metals, you know, um, it's all to do with the health risk sort of potential things. So, if there's long term <coughs> threats to the resistance or microbiome, so that one way. Yeah. I mean, the main thing I think which would help you in the modeling is actually have a standardized approach to actually assessing. So, while we're doing all this, that's where um, having a 
the right replacement value in some ways can be a good start as well. We always start off with that way because um, it's independent of the type of plant material you put, plant you're actually studying, uh, soil types. <laughs> you cut out that variability. Um, so the perhaps the um, tip up bees are not a good point to the standard approach. Uh, question for Len. Um, with regard to the solid fertilizer you used in your trial, yeah. was that a controlled release fertilizer yeah. or was it a straight yeah. compound, highly soluble fertilizer? It's a slow release, but we, we got that from a dehydrator, a sort of food waste dehydrator, if I'm not kidding. Yeah. Organic one. Yeah. You're, are you referring to the organic one? Uh, no, the 28% nitrogen one you were using. Ah, the commercial one. Yeah, I slow release one. Release? Yes, yeah. slow release one. Yeah, the, slow, yeah. The, the usual one that we're using in Smartness. So to, to your point, yeah. um, microplastics should be something you should be considering in that yeah. trial too by capturing those microplastics as that material breaks down. Because that's one of the big issues that will be, you know, probably debated in the future when it comes to use of control of these fertilizers in our environment. Um, there's a big benefit, right, obviously, yeah. to the urine-based fertilizers against control release fertilizers, even though they're great, you know, in terms of labor, yeah. you're not using, you're only putting it out once or twice a year, yeah. uh, you're putting out a lot of microplastics into the environment, so it'd be good to sort of start analyzing those sort of materials. Sure, yeah, yeah. good to do that. How does one do that? <coughs> how, how does one measure? Good question, oh, I'm going to Yeah, microplastics, we've got measurement tools, I don't have to, yeah, sorry. It is a special microscopy area. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I think one, I don't want to hold up. Thanks, right? So I'm not a fertilizer guy. But um, my question is around um, um, looking at the product that comes straight out of Ergol or Ugol or any other store. The other way of like, like screening or getting a bit of a hunch about where's the best application um, for that product might be um, before you do any um, sort of uh, behavioral, uh, you know, fertilizer behavioral studies. I know they're important, um, but it's kind of a bit like a medicine, um, you know, the pre, you know, pre-trial probability of most new medicines. And, Thinking is, um, you know, it's definitely a fairly vague, open-ended question. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? So, in terms of, you're talking about the crop, or yeah, the, where where, or is, where is that niche likely to be based on what you're seeing um, from from the, the composition and what we know about other fertilizers? Is there, do you have any? Do you get any hunches about where the niche for that product? Well, I think to start with, it'd be a non-food, <laughs> to be yeah. turf, right? Yeah. But I think that when you look for something, it's not so much the plant requirements, but rather your soil deficiencies. Um, so, for instance, we had no idea that biosolids would be so um, brilliant, um, except that we were putting in the, the old red um, going down the soil, which are phosphorus deficient. Yeah. So, you look for a... Um, Sandy soils. Um, so really, that's what your niche will be. Um, is more around what environment you're going to put it to, and it will behave differently. <laughs> um, whether you've got a turf out at Wilberforce, which is yeah. still got turf farms out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 Um, you know, there's. A, I mean, that's the, the thing is that you'll have to start to um, change the, the fertilizer requirements based on your soil, not your plant. That's going to be consistent all, all throughout the crop. Well, it's, can I make comments? Partly, partly your soil, obviously, the sodium levels. Um, you know, from our perspective in the fertilizer game, you know, I, I guess sodium, you know, you look, you look at plants that are, that are not sensitive to sodium. Yeah. Um, and it's very interesting that you mentioned the silica. Um, turf, obviously, is a great example of, you know, a silica loving, yep. Yep. accumulating plant. So, yep. You look at say a turf that is not sensitive to sodium, like a zoysia or something, and loves silica. So there's a niche mm -hmm. market straight away. Like 
the Zoysia turf, which is in both professional um, turf situations in golf courses, but also in home. There's a long average life um, Zoysia being yeah. sold in a, in a home situation. So that's an example of but from Yates' perspective, you know, we, I think I've presented this last year that in our wheat and feed, we, we sell about three million litres of liquid wheat and feed, and we use urea um, as the feed part. We use urine as the, the feed part of your wheat and feed. And there's another niche opportunity. Three million in Australia? Yeah. Okay. Is there enough urine in Australia? <laughs> no, start drinking water. Everyone in the toilets one more time. Get your coffee. <laughs> Um, any more questions? Yep. Maybe then I can talk. I was going to ask. The service. Does anyone uh, want to ask Dana about her? Thank you. So um, going back to the you know the notions behind circular economy. So we know it's, it's obviously not just all about developing products and recycling. We need to think about the efficiency side and um, and the demand side as well. And you, you know talking about service provision as well. So. A couple of years ago, when we were working with um, stakeholders in the Sydney Basin, we came across a great, um, a partly like a fertilizer retailer in the Sydney Basin, and they had a really interesting um, model, which was based, they didn't realize, but it was based on um, service provision. So instead of selling their customers phosphate based fertilizers, and their customers were asking for those, those fertilizers, they were like, no, 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 the, you know, the Sydney Basin is oversaturated in, in phosphorus, you know, let's test your soils, I'll show you. And then it's like they will they would rather sell an agronomic service to say, well, let's, you know, you're coming to me because you want to improve your yields or some kind of productivity on farm. So we'll sell you a service to show you how you can meet that goal, achieve, achieve that productivity without adding any more fertilizers. And so then it's a wonderful win-win because then the customer, the farmer, gets those, you know, those added yields or the increased productivity. It's a really competitive business model for the um, that particular um, business because they're, they're doing something different and great environmental benefits. There's less phosphorus building up in our Sydney soils that can run off and you know, pollute the whole European, for example. There's phosphate rock being mined. So it was just a really nice example and there's probably many more out there. It was just one that we stumbled across that I thought was really good to illustrate this point that we can and should be thinking about service provision and in the, the fertiliser sector doesn't just need to be thinking about that. So that's, that's one of the transformations I think that can happen within the fertiliser sector to think about service delivery alongside product delivery. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Any more questions? If not, um, so I've got written down future plans and closing remarks, Stefano. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. What a day it has been. My job is to hold you back from the drinks. So, uh, so it's been really good to see the progress. One year ago we met and we only had grand plans. And now we actually see things really happening. So that's very pleasing. What uh, we liked, I just had a chat with Sean, is that uh, we are seeing also collaborations really happening, start happening. So, you know, a few examples. We've seen UQ and Melbourne, we're going to be working together on the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, UTS and the Brisbane node will be giving fertilizer to both Jeff and Bernadette, and they're going to be doing different types of testing. And uh, we are going to provide input for Sayed, for example, uh, for his project. So the expectation is there's going to be more and more interactions as we move forward and that's really the, the the whole point behind the hub rather than working in silos and it seems to me we're not working in silos so that's uh, a good recipe for success and so as we move forward it'd be nice to see how uh, the, all the pieces of work that uh, we generate are going to be collaborative so with uh, the authors from different institutions including different industry partners so, Sean mentioned this morning, what we're going for is value chains, people and policies, technology and innovation. I think we've covered all of that. And so we have really 
something to look forward to. Before the drinks, we just want to raise again your awareness on two uh, opportunities that uh, there are for contributing or sharing our knowledge with the broader industry and the public. One is Oswater 24, uh, which uh, we already mentioned. We have decided uh, during one of the breaks we're going to put in an application for a, a workshop. So we'll do that. If that comes through, we'll be contacting several of you uh, for your potential participation there, obviously, if you're planning to come to Oswater. But, uh, but that will be really providing a unmatched visibility uh, for the for a nice hub in front of the um, whole water industry of the country. So that uh, would be a very uh, nice opportunity. And the other one, coming back to the first speak of the day, Abram has uh, the yearly Rich Earth Institute uh, you know, uh, Summit uh, coming up. You would like to finish off to... Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Say a couple of words. Yeah. yeah thank you. It's um it's November seven through nine this year, and there is there's for full virtual participation. It's in an awkward time zone, um, <laughs> but there are recordings, and there are parts of it that won't be so horrible in time. Um, and uh, and I I would love people to attend if you can, and uh, and also think about think about submitting for next year. I've been so inspired by by what I've been hearing today, and there are so many opportunities for uh, information sharing or even collaboration. So I hope we can have you know, a strong connection between Nice Hub and, um, and all the folks who, who congregate at the Rich Earth Summit and, and you know, us at Rich Earth also. So please consider attending. And, um, and you can email me or just search Rich Earth Summit for more information on that. Thank you. All right. So the last thing to be done is uh, get as many fluids as you can into your body and don't forget to visit the toilets to leave a donation for Sean. This will all turn into herbal. For you good, uh, come and visit us uh, next year at Victoria Park, beautiful location in Brisbane, and uh, leave your present there as well. <laughs> all right, so now we're just going to have... Uh, a little bit of uh, networking and social time, and, and Sean said that we might have an opportunity to visit the basement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, all of this in the coming hour. Enjoy.